In Dover and still at port, the P&O ferries with their new crews are waiting sign off. Crews we now know are paid on average £5.50 an hour. The 800 seafarers they replaced were sacked on the spot last week and one of them, Lee Davison, came face to face with his old bosses today. I uh, got quite heated at times, I'm not going to lie, because um, they were saying it's not personal. Of course it's personal, we just sacked 800 people over a Teams meeting. He, along with his union, asked P&O to reinstate those jobs at a meeting today, one that lasted just 20 minutes. A blanket no, this is our plan, this is what we're doing, and um, that's it, basically. Stony-faced res um, resentment. Yesterday, under fire from MPs, the company's chief exec, Peter Hebblethwaite, stood his ground, saying... I, um, I would make this decision again, I'm afraid. But today, in a carefully worded email to P&O staff, he said... This type of dismissal could not and would not happen again. This was a unique situation. He also admitted P&O had broken employment law. That's quite amazing, isn't it? You're coming to this parliament and putting your hands up and saying you willfully chose to break the law. We did not believe that there was any other way to do this. But today, he called this breach... A failure to comply with the obligation to consult. No criminal offence has been committed. The shift in tone, perhaps a sign he knows the screws are tightening. Today, the Transport Secretary is saying it's him who should be out of a job. I thought it was brazen, breathtaking, arrogant. Uh, I can't imagine that he'll be able to remain in that job. Um, but uh, they're a private company, uh, but uh, it seems to me he should go. Grant Shapps vowed to legislate next week to close the loophole P&O ferries used to sack their employees. It's a move that will have wider implications for a sector that's used these tactics before, just never quite on the same scale. But can it get through Parliament before employees are gagged and barred from taking any legal action by the settlement agreement they've been offered, and which we've obtained a copy of? To get their payoff, they have to state they have not made and agree not to make any statement or comment to the press, that they won't disclose the terms of the deal. The settlement also bars them from taking legal action and protects P&O ferries from any past, present and future claims. Employees have just under a week to sign this deal. If they don't, they'll only get statutory redundancy. Now, that's a much lower sum. As one of them put it to me earlier today, I don't like the terms of this deal, but I've got to put food on the table. P&O say no one will walk away with less than £15,000, that without cutting staff pay, the business will sink a strategy that's now set them on a collision course, not just with their former crew, but the government itself. Well, earlier I spoke to Martin Gray of the international maritime trade union, Nautilus International, and I began by asking him how his meeting today went with p &O. The company has made clear that they are committed to remaining unlawful and not engaging with the recognised trade unions and not engaging with their workforce in trying to find a way forward that sits within employment law of the UK. But the Transport Secretary suggests that this legislation he hopes to introduce next week will force the company into a U-turn. And as you rightly say, the company show no signs of changing their mind on this. I think... Uh, the company, as much as they are committed to their disastrous course of action, if the government intervenes and intervenes in such a way where the company has to make a U-turn, then that's all for the good of the workforce. But reputationally, will the company survive? Are you advising your members to sign these contracts or to reject them, given that the company say some workers will be offered... 91 weeks pay and the possibility of re-employment. I mean, are you worried that a lot of your members at the end of the day, bef before any new legislation comes in, will just say, I have to take this? And the battle's we, lost. We are in uncharted territory. We've never seen something like this. And this is going to be a real litmus test as to the government's commitment to levelling up, to working people, to Maritime 2050, as to what these actions and next steps are, whether or not it will actually make action where, at present, it seems to be making a lot of noise. As a union, what is your aim right now? Is it, in reality, to get all of the 800 jobs back or do you accept that that is now gone quite frankly 
I would forgive any member for not wanting to return to P&O ferries. And as a union, what we want is what our members want. And whatever it is that the members are saying, if we can get it to a point at which the company has no choice but to reinstate and our members want to go back and work for P&O ferries, then absolutely that's the course of action that we'll pursue for those members. But if we have impacted members who are traumatised about the way that they were bullied out of their places of work, bullied out of places that they live, that have seen their belongings Belongings in skips inside the uh, car decks of the vessels that are currently alongside and do not wish to put themselves through that with a shoddy employer that has already proven once it has no hesitation in acting outside of the law, then we would be very understanding of that too. And what we would be looking for is the best possible thing for each member based upon what they want. Because you must admit it would be difficult for some workers to want to go back and expose themselves to that level of callous disregard that P&O ferries have shown towards them, despite all of their hard work across the COVID pandemic and before. Martin Gray, Executive Officer of Nautilus, thanks very much for talking to us.